So, and of course, the lead singer of High Top stops in the middle of this to tell everybody that, you know, even if they don't get the part, Jesus still loves him. Oh. He might not love him, but Jesus loves him. I feel like you don't need to Jesus pitch people trying out for your literal fucking Jesus pitch, right? Yeah. The, the only thing more absurd <laughs> would be for someone to interrupt him during his pitch to pitch him on Jesus. Hey, I'm, I'm so sorry, Rob Schneider, but um, I just want you to know. Awful movie. 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 Welcome back to the Gamcast, where each week we sample another selection from Christian cinema because it turns out judges have way more sentencing leeway than we thought they did. I'm your host, No Illusions. Heath will be unable to join us this week, but sitting 900 miles to my northeast is my bad friend, Eli Bosnick. Eli, how are you this fine afternoon, sir? Jazz hands and jazz hands and step up, Jay. Step up, Jay. <laughs> and also joining us this week is skeptic extraordinaire Michael Marshall. Marsh, welcome back, sir. Hey, thanks a lot, guys. Uh, you can't see it, but I've got my arms out like an airplane and I'm sort of spinning. Yes, so I'm right. I count. It counts. It's this but, is yeah. this is this is right. My leg is going up slightly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So uh, tell us, Marsh, what will we be breaking down today? Oh, uh, we watched high tops. It is the 1985 musical about a bunch of high school kids who love this Christian band so much that they basically constantly shout sing to each other about it yeah. for about an hour and a bit. <laughs> it's, it's saved by the yell is what we watched. <laughs> <laughs> and Eli, how bad was this movie? Well... If you loved when that improv troupe of 40-year-olds came to your school to rap about not smoking, <laughs> but you wish they'd talked more about their happy science cult's understanding of Christianity, <laughs> you will love this movie. Yeah. No, it's a it's a live action musical about shoes. I have to look, I'm not saying I wasn't terrified by every minute of this thing, but exactly how did this wind up in its in, in the spooktacular, Eli. You know, sometimes when you want to scare someone and, you know, Marsh has seen the things that he's seen, <laughs> you've got to get very creative <laughs> with uh, your definitions of terror and right. madness. Yeah, no, this was one of the scariest things I've ever seen. That That's that's fair. It just wasn't <laughs> in, uh, in the horror genre. All right, so is there anything you guys want to nominate this one for being the best at being the worst at? Absolutely. I'm going to say best worst inexplicable footwear obsession, right? Because <laughs> this movie is called High Tops and it's called High Tops because it's about a band, a Christian band called High Tops. And that band is called High Tops because they sing a song called High Tops. And they sing that song about High Tops because they wear High Tops. And they wear High Tops because... I've got nothing. Their I've got band oh. is called. Yeah, no, is you just have to fucking connect the Ouroboros to itself. Yeah, <laughs> it's well. So we, the thing is, is that it literally came. I guarantee it literally came from somebody going, "What are kids into these days? They got the big shoes. They like the big shoes, right? Uh, high tops." Yeah, and then they were like, "Yeah, that's the movie. That's the fucking play. That's the theme." And they never bothered to tie it into anything. So it's or just... even make the lead singer of the band wear high tops. Because really? I don't think no. he's wearing high tops. Yeah. That's the most upsetting part. I'll admit, <laughs> I could forgive everything else if the entire band was wearing high tops. But that dude's just super duper clearly not wearing high tops yes. throughout the entire musical. <laughs> baffling. Absolutely baffling. So they didn't have high tops budgets. Come on, those were expensive. <laughs> So I was, we've already alluded to this, of course, but I'm going to go with best worst backup dancers. Oh yeah, baby. Right. So the, the backup dancers had a very like, you can't dance in the play unless your little sister can come to kind of a feel to them. Right. Like they, everything was, <laughs> it was like we were trying to dumb something down so that Heath could dance along with us. Yeah. <laughs> right. It's a musical. If uh, nobody in your musical knew a single person of color, yes, right? right. Just choreographed <laughs> and danced by the whitest of white people. <laughs> That's Yeah. This, this is what the world would be like if there had only ever been white people. Right. Exactly. Oh, it's, it's like the backup dancers are like when you, you play Mortal Kombat, but you don't know the moves. So you just keep doing the same move over <laughs> again and hope that you can kill someone. <laughs> right, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Kick, I felt kick, corner kick. trapped by this movie. <laughs> <laughs> And I'm going to go with best, best 
audience. <laughs> so this is a filmed version. First of all, I want to thank everyone who recommended this. This movie has been recommended genuinely like dozens of times over the years because in addition to this being this glorious movie that we witnessed, this was a traveling show that a bunch of our listeners were forced to watch. And as I was assured multiple times when this was recommended, this filmed version is the best version of the show. Ooh. This is the star cast, right? This is the Patty Lapone, you know, getting up there. This is the this is the first Broadway run you want to see. People that recommended this saw a lower quality oh, version no. of this show. Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> but that doesn't stop this audience, the live audience that this show is being performed in front of, from losing their god right? damn my, I've mm. never worked to as good a crowd as this. they're hooting and all. Oh, oh yeah. Oh. Oh, yeah, right. So we'll get there when and we'll get there quite often. <laughs> all right, well, I'll tell you what. I have a lot of very unfortunate 80s trends to revisit this week, so I'm going to need a minute to prepare. But we'll be back in a flash with all the atonal caterwauling that is High Tops. All right, everybody, gather around. Time to write our brand new Christian musical, High Tops. Okay, why is it called High Tops? I'm glad you asked. It's because the Christian musical inside of our Christian musical is called High Tops. Sorry, wait, there's a Christian musical in our Christian musical? Yep, that's the whole plot. Okay, but then why are they called high tops? Right, uh, because they wear high top converse shoes. So some of them, it's, you know, like, so, sometimes they do. Okay, but why? Why do they wear high tops except for some of them? Okay. Well, what does that have to do with Christianity or the title or anything else we're going to do in our musical? Yes, thank you, thank you. Guys, guys, what's the first rule of Christian Musical Club? <sighs> Too many questions turn you gay. Turn you gay, exactly. We don't want to end up like Alan, do we? <sighs> no. I guess not. How is Alan, anyway? Oh, him and his husband just opened up a bed and breakfast. Oh, that's nice. Uh, oh, I mean, that's, that's bad. That's bad. Bad, bad, mm -hmm. exactly. Thank you. And we're back for the breakdown. We're going to open up as so often we do on a Bible quote, this time Ephesians 6.12, which reads, For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against power, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. In other words, that's how they get you, right? That's <laughs> yeah. Bible for that. Yeah, I'll be honest. I didn't even read it. And I realized I should have read it. It was the first, the opening thing. But I just saw that it was a Bible quote. And I was like, ah, it's fine. These guys, these guys have got that sorted. I'll, <laughs> yeah. I'll come and do something else. There's a lot of words on the screen. I don't want to have to read them all. That's a lot. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, understandable. <laughs> and also never relates in any real way to the show. And never, they nope. never. Do. Exactly. Yeah. It's like, okay, Bible quote. Gotcha. We're yep. moving on. It's fine. And to be fair, like what, what they will be fighting against is, let's spoil it now, Carl the Pug and Pegasus. So it really, <laughs> it is, it is, the it Ephesians is, quote is. seems pretty unnecessary. <laughs> All right. And so now this is very clearly, this was created as poster fodder to get 12-year-old boys to come to this thing. We open up on these silly motorcycle helmeted space angels with giant swords. Oh, yeah. yeah. It's, it's Daft Punk trying to teach us the Bible is what this is. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah. So we, we get, we see them, they're just going to kind of prance around a little bit at the beginning of the thing and then just disappear. But the play itself opens up and a bunch of teenagers getting ready for the big concert, musical prelude style. <laughs> and these kids are introduced by stereotype. Yes. Right? Like they might as well just walk on and yell a mean name about themselves. <laughs> like, I'm the nerd and I'm <laughs> stupid and I'm the whore whose parents don't love me. <laughs> Hi, <Hot times. laughs> Yes. But walking on and yelling is exactly what they do. And it's because they think, you know, it's, it's fine. Acting and shouting are basically synonymous. If you're loud <laughs> enough, you're acting there is you what go. they think. Yep. Yeah. yeah. Exactly. The, the ancient Greek tradition. <laughs> and there's so, the, for what's going on there's so little going on on stage but it seems to be happening with just what i considered a baffling level of intensity right like i felt like something bad was going to happen but i couldn't figure what then i realized it was this movie that was the bad thing that was coming up <laughs> was the rest of this movie so okay so very quickly we get tony has the hots for heather barbara pole i don't know the character's name she was dressed in red and white stripes so i just have her as barbara pole throughout my notes oh circus big tent yes. yeah yeah yeah, no yeah. Uh -huh. yeah. 
So she likes Tony, but Tony doesn't like her back because she's not Christian and pure enough, apparently. And nerd kid is a nerd and everyone else just is there to fill in dialogue occasionally. Yeah, everyone else will have various lines to provide information to those three characters. Right, <laughs> four, yeah. Uh-huh. So, okay, but this ends with the nerd going like, wait, who's who's playing at the concert? And everybody goes, it's High Tops. Now the name makes sense. No more questions on that. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, so we cut to the big concert. Well, we cut to the fucking sword-wielding space angels first, but then we cut to the big concert. Oh. Yeah, and I did have in my notes, is this just going to be a collection of inexplicable songs gently intercut by sword-wielding Daft Punk? And yes, that is basically yeah. what we mm-hmm. have. Yeah, yeah, sword-wielding Daft Punk is mysteriously absent through most of the film. But yeah, we just do different, you know, we replace them with backup dancers eventually. Yeah. Yes, yeah, yeah, yeah. Future Marsh, past Marsh was trying to warn you. <laughs> <laughs> also, this is where the outfits are peak 80s. I wrote in my notes here, no and Lucinda didn't have a wedding because they were poor, but if they did, this is what they would have worn. Okay, we got married in the 90s, at least. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, so we watched this woman sing, and it's just a song, because like, this is like, like, it can be any old fucking Jesus song, right? So that's what she sings, any old Jesus song. Oh, We do, but she comes in so incredibly flat. And it's weird because she's very clearly dubbed. Yes. So they must have given her another go. And this was the best take that they got. And it's so achingly flat. It's impressive. It's genuinely impressive. Also, her hair is like if you tried to do a bowl cut, but all you had was a wok. Yes. Right. Yes. Yeah, yeah. She clearly went into a hair salon with a photo of a Japanese pagoda. Like, <laughs> one of them, please. I'll have one of these. Yeah. yeah. Also, they do this thing, and we've we've all seen this touchstone, right? Where it's a it's a song and dance movie. And so as part of the break during that, someone does some super impressive gymnastics. <laughs> and so everyone but it, in this case, it's just like me doing a cartwheel. And I mean me. Me doing a cartwheel, right? So much so that the audience pauses before they realize they're supposed to applaud, right? The audience, the guy's like, ah! and then there's a pause and the audience is like, oh shit, that was oh, it. Oh, I thought yeah, that was leading into yeah. a flip or something, but no. Yeah, yeah. I, I assume that pause was them making sure that they were all kids. That, that person is not made to do a cartwheel <laughs> like that. Are we, are we sure this didn't just end really badly and this is going to be on some sort of compilation of horrific events that have happened in theatre and then we'll be the monsters cheering it. And it was only when the person carried on walking said, so it's fine, we can, we can then cheer, it's fine. So, and honestly, I, I have to say the most terrifying thing about this entire movie for me was that closed captioning was unavailable? Yeah. Yes, 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 yes. The captions were very much, you are on your own. We are not being part <laughs> yes. of this. Which is why, like, throughout my notes, I've just got what I think it sounds like they said. Mm-hmm. And at one point, they're talking about how Jesus is the father of lice. Yes. Like, the father of lice? I had that in my notes as well. Yeah. It's lights. It's lights, apparently. Yep. But for a long time, it was the father of lice. Well, you only yeah. know that because it rhymes with night later, right? Yeah. You just, it, because it, she says that. He's like, he's the father of lice. And I'm like, well, he created all the animals. I just don't think that's the one he really wants to be known. <laughs> Not the one he wants you to lead with. I mean, I get it. <laughs> and th- there's a part where it says, if you walk in his, the music goes, if you walk in his light, you can talk with each other and fra you humming. What? <laughs> 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 Something about blotting out the sun. What is going on in this song? <laughs> yeah. No idea. I looked at that in Marsh's notes and I was like, oh, I'm going to go and see what it is. But he's right. It is for Heinemann. <laughs> <laughs> yes, it absolutely is. <laughs> and then, all right, so that song wraps up. And then we meet Satan the pug a peg Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you combine the voice of Carl the Pug of Pegacorn of what Tucker Carlson dreams about when someone says drag queen story hour, this is the character of Satan in this movie. Absolutely. He, he is dressed like he's doing devil themed drag at the Baphomet burlesque. That is how he is dressed. <laughs> yep. And he's talking like this right here. And I'm like, yeah, the idea that Satan's from Joyzy, that tracks, that tracks. Yeah. <laughs> no, it does make, I've, I, they've obviously been in my traffic. I get yeah. it. Yeah. So it's, there's also several moments, and this is just a general note for the Satan character. There will be several moments where the actor obviously doesn't know how to do a Jersey accent. So he got like a phonetic how to do a Jersey accent. Yeah you know, Mm -hmm. tape from his local five and dime. And so he will end on a word which makes no sense. And his first line is pretty close to that. He goes, I'm not as bad as they say I am. I'm wise. And I was like, you're what? (laughs) And then I had to watch it again to be like, oh, he means worse. He means worse with an accent. There's several of those moments. Yeah. 
So, but he's going to, he's going to do a little shtick, but then he's going to explain to us that he hates Christian music concerts. Right. And at this point, we're all on his side. Yeah, right. Who doesn't? Like, yeah. Who doesn't? Yeah, absolutely. Satan. And then he explains that he hates high top shoes because they are, as near as I could tell, holier than they're haughty. They're a little bougie for him. I have no idea <laughs> what this film has about high top shoes. Normally, I do a lot of weird research when I get bored in the middle of these films. And I start to look into what they had on high tops, why they were so against <laughs> high tops or for high tops. Or, and I found nothing. I've got no idea other than what you said, no, which was that high tops are fashionable. We'll just use a word that's in the news and crack on from there. Yeah. Absolutely baffling. It's kept me awake for days. I haven't slept for days since I've seen this. So I had this mo moment too. Like it was a real kind of a breakdown moment for me. Because at one point he goes, Eddie's Christian musicals, they make me sick. But luckily I brought some Pepto. And he opens his Pepto and the crowd goes fucking nuts. The they crowd lost just their orgasms. And I was like, guys, if we did Christian comedy, we would only need to come up with like three jokes a month to keep out this pace of podcast production, right? Oh, yeah. That's the thing. <sighs> it's always there. Yeah, it's, it's almost worth becoming a bigot. <laughs> we're, we're, here's the thing. The minute we turn evil, we're the best at our job. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> so, but eventually, though, the space angel, the besorted space angel chases Satan off with his robotic voice. Mm-hmm. This is where I noticed, by the way, that these space angels, when you see them, they'll always be holding their swords by the blade. Oh, constantly. Yes. Yeah, yeah, right? absolutely. Because very clearly, otherwise, the blade would fall off the fucking hand. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, no, they weren't going for the, uh, you know, super nice cardboard when they made the props right, for yeah. this movie, which I, I talk about this later, but this is throughout the movie. This movie is the weirdest combination of like high budget and low budget I've ever seen. Yes. Because on the one hand, it's very clearly professionally filmed and this mm. full musical being done in what I assume is a theater. And and on the other hand, most of the set is painted cardboard. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. A lot of that. So, okay. So then we, we get back to the Satan wanders off and we get back to the concert and it's time for them to do their, their last song. It's the Jesus fight song. <laughs> so all the backup dancers, they pull up their shiny shields and they sing this song that is, and we see this constantly in Christian movies that are aimed at teenagers. They're singing a like, you know, being a Christian is pretty badass if you think about it song, which is doubly self-defeating when it's presented as a fucking show tune. <laughs> so yeah. <laughs> yeah. If you give these people maximum credit, it's singing a song about a pretend holy war. Yeah. But with without that credit, they're just singing a happy, jaunty tune about dying in a holy war for Jesus. About how happy they would be to die for Christ. Yeah. <laughs> it's so fucked up. And, and they're being led in that refrain by what looks like Chachi in a red cummerbund. That is basically <laughs> who is leading the high tops. Also, and I almost had this as best worst, it's the disparity between the actors' faces and the voices that they give them in the dubbing over. Because yeah. Chachi on this has an incredibly, and I would say completely out of place, low voice, like weirdly low voice for this song that sounds a bit like kind of Depeche Mode or the Human League while he's bouncing around looking like 1950s Cliff Richards. <laughs> it's such a weird mix. Yeah, he looks like if Rob Schneider was in a biopic about Rob Schneider and they <laughs> younged him up. That's what this guy looks like. I also... They go through the stupid parts of the armor of God, but they lose their courage because the armor of God gets super stupid. Mm -hmm. They're like, the blessed blade of righteousness and the shield of justice. Never mind the sandals of whatever, I don't know, fucking continents <laughs> yes. or whatever. It's, it's fine. Do a cartwheel. Again, could not understand a word they were singing, so I just wrote down what I sound like. Though it bad as the one still inside paddle yet. Yep, <laughs> that's what I got. Mm -hmm. I managed to figure out one of them from uh, context clues because the refrain was until all of my deal. And I realized <laughs> after about six times that it's enemies yield until all of my enemies yield. Oh. And then I realized what happens is if I just, I can only figure the lyrics out if I try and transcribe them phonetically as to the noises it sounds like they're saying, and then me try and say those noises out loud several times, eventually it clicks as to what words that's ought to be. But it takes that amount of effort to get to even one of the lyrics to this song. Interesting. To any of these songs. But in fact, that's how Noah reads my notes in our It is. It is. <laughs> so yeah, it's just... <laughs> 
<laughs> All right, so this song wraps up. The 26 people in the crowd go fucking nuts for it. <laughs> and then Chachi comes out to explain why they're called high tops. And it's because high tops are a symbol for reaching up. And what's up? God. Yeah. Get it? They're not, though, are they? <laughs> They're not. <laughs> and it was at this point that I realized he isn't wearing high tops. He's wearing some sort of boots that I couldn't tell if he was wearing a tardigrade on each foot or if it was just that he is a tardigrade from the waist down. Oh, like interesting. Kind of centaur or mermaid. I yeah. couldn't tell which of those two it was. Oh, and even he realizes this doesn't make any sense because then he'd be like, wow, I guess we would be called hats if that was <laughs> where we're going. So, you know what? Shoes are like running, you know, running. And sometimes you run towards a good or bad. Th anyway, thank you so much for coming out tonight. <laughs> I don't know why we wrote this into the script. We didn't have to. We could have just uh, <laughs> left it alone. But uh, whoo, all right. Well, thanks for coming out. Also, and this is the craziest introduction to a musical I've ever heard. Would any of you like to be in our band? Yes. We're having auditions tomorrow. <laughs> Goodbye. Right. Oh, it's so good. He posts a job ad on the stage during the concert. It's fucking amazing. And by the way, Larry's <laughs> fired. I don't know if you guys know, but uh, we just found out he was gay. So we're going to need a new Larry. <laughs> I mean, you all saw his performance just now. It was really... <laughs> Maybe that's it. Maybe High Tops is like the fall, you know, the, like the a, a 1980s iteration of the fall and like oh, Marky e. Smith just sacking every single member of the band <laughs> constantly that they've just gone through anybody who is a, a plausible music musician. Now they have to actually audition their fans during concerts <laughs> yeah, because right, he's such yeah. an intolerable asshole. Podcast listener, if you get Marsha's jokes about the fall just now, your back hurts, but you're British, so you have health care. So so what I will say is you guys have quite a large British audience. I know that because they're coming to QED. And finally, you've got someone on the show who will cater to their but, cultural yep, taste. No, that's <laughs> exactly. That's finally, <laughs> the fall references they've so long for. Yeah, it's all like, oh, Guns N' Roses. Oh, American football. The British people that you listen to don't care about those things. <laughs> Give them something British. Like your rice true. pudding. Yorkshire puddings, <laughs> other types of puddings. That's right. So, all right. So the band leaves. All the teenagers rush the stage, hoping to get like some souvenir navel lint or whatever <laughs> on the on the way out. Also, so a little behind the curtain here. When we're doing the notes for this, someone will write like the first sentence of a new scene. So, you know, like, oh, it's a new season. Then we start. This is how we break up our notes. And I wanted to give a big shout out for Marsh, who cued this scene with back to the screaming people. <laughs> <laughs> The problem is sometimes I watch these films before you and I don't take the labeling of the scenes as seriously or as helpfully as you guys. So it's just sometimes it's it's just my inner monologue spilling out on the, uh, on the right, page. Right. <laughs> it's the only place he can be free. So <laughs> So yeah, so all of the teenagers, quote unquote, that we've already met, they want to join the band and they're all gonna do the auditions and they should do the auditions together and they should get shoes, you know, whatever. It's just a bunch of that shit for God, five fucking minutes. Can I can I bring up something here that I found disturbing and quite spectacular? Hmm. Can we talk about stupid guy who disappears from the rest of the play? <laughs> the guy with the Hawaiian shirt? <laughs> yeah, there's a guy in a Hawaiian shirt who in this scene will very clearly be established as a main character and one of the kids at this high school. After this scene, he will never be spoken to or about <laughs> again. He showed up at the bows and I was like, fuck, what the hell happened to that guy? Right. I assumed he fell and hurt himself backstage <laughs> and like <laughs> toughed it out for the bows. So, and so while they're all talking about how they're going to audition for the band, Nerd Kid walks on stage to a fucking favorite character on a 1990s Fox sitcom reception. They Ugh. lose their minds for him. God, that character is so fucking insufferable from the second it's on, yes. he's on stage and it just gets worse throughout. I hate him so much. Well, it's just the it's just the stereotypical nerd character with no thought put into it whatsoever from 1985, right? Right. Mm. It's like if you wrote let a high school bully write a nerd character because there's no redemption arc. Nope. There's no, oh, he's actually a this or, you know, I've learned you're actually a that. He's just always like, I pooped in my cell. <laughs> <laughs> at a certain point, and we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll talk about it when we get to the scenes. At a certain point, I was like, did I 
create high tops to try to drive Martian insane <laughs> with two or three of these characters' voices. If if I found out that high tops was actually created and filmed in like 2018, but sort of set with a back mythology that it was a 1985 Christian film that and it was all just bullshit, dry, designed to drive people insane, that would make so much sense. Yeah. yeah. That would make a lot more sense than what we actually had to watch here. Yeah. So yeah, so this bit, by the way, goes on for fucking ever. The nerd bit, it just, mm -hmm. we, we watched for six minutes him going, and I have zits. Oh gosh, and all the zits. <laughs> He does have the most points on Space Invaders, which to me sounds like he's thrown down, Noah. You've got to contact this kid. <laughs> yeah, that was the first video game to save high scores, actually. Um, <laughs> so so by, by definition, it's the only one he's got the high score. But by also, 1985, we had some other ones then. <laughs> all of his references are so topical to the 80s that they completely miss now. He's like, and I can't stop wearing my vibe and vavoom cereals. <laughs> and oh my gosh, my munchos. And I'm going to, at one point he references a deodorant brand and I had to like Google it and go back <laughs> through the Wikipedia archives to see which Old Spice <laughs> brand bought it out in 1992. <laughs> so yeah, so, so he leaves... And Heather and, and Tony, who are the couple, sort of sort of the main character couple, they have also left. And so all of the other kids are going to gossip about how the two of them are going to go buy high tops together in the next scene. Was this film fucking sponsored by the manufacturers of That's, high tops? <laughs> I, I can only imagine that like they found an unlocked shoe store as they were writing this musical and they were like, wait, wait, guys. What if instead of selling these for fentanyl, we based a musical <laughs> around their availability? So, all right. So they, so they roll in some quick signage and it's time for them to go to the shoe store. All the kids come dancing in and they sing a song about high tops. Oh, God. Again. They come dancing in, but like 40% of their dance moves are just doing a high kick. Well, I, high is, is, is very generous. Uh, okay, <laughs> medium high kick, a medium yeah. high, a, a, a waist level kick. And then another 40% is just airplane arms. So it's yep. like high kick, high kick, airplane arms, high kick, airplane arms. We're done. Yeah. That for 20 minutes straight. Oh, God. And the, the lyrics, it's like, run in the sun. Look at you run in your high tops. Back when music meant something. <laughs> the, like these lyrics are banal compared to scat. Yeah. <laughs> Thing is, they're not even necessarily really a running shoe, though, are they? Like a high top no, converse. Not really. so it's not even <laughs> like, look at you running your high tops. Badly, you should be wearing some sort of like ergonomic running shoe. <laughs> you'd be way more efficient. You'd, be, you'd shave minutes off your personal best over a few miles. But they're really excited about this. So they, they do some <laughs> low level acrobatics. Well, break dancing. They, the same guy, the same guy comes and does another. Yes. Acrobatics. As though he heard us joking earlier in the podcast and was like, I can also do a handspring. Yes. I was actually saving the handspring towards the end of act one. Just so you know, just so you know. And then the nerd kid, they do the like the assisted backflip. Him and, and Tony do the assisted backflip thing. And then he goes to do a little break dancing and then thinks better of it. Yep. <laughs> so. Oh, yeah, yeah. We've got 80s white guy break dancing, a.k.a. bottom scooching. Yes. He does like yeah. a little bottom scooch, bottom scooch in a circle. Ta-da, done. Yeah. Look, one of my life goals and one of my deepest fantasies is to surround Heath with a circle of people who just start go Heath, go Heath, go Heath <laughs> until we trick him into dancing and then everybody boos him. The dancing <laughs> happening on this stage is about as close to that fantasy as I've gotten at this point in my life. God, 100%. <laughs> and what, what we cannot emphasize enough is just how this is all happening under the same basically two lines of a song repeated, I would say, 500 yes. times. Like, the audience give a massive cheer when the song's finished, and I can only assume that's because they realise they're no longer stuck in a time loop, that they are free to go about their lives and have, like, families and yes. children and, and age because the time loop is broken. Right, that they are going to get to the back to the parking lot at some point. Yeah, no, the, the, <laughs> the whole song, the song is about the fact that high tops are a kind of shoe, mm. right? That's the only thing. There's the, the High tops don't come to symbolize anything within the song. It's just, hey, look at those shoes. Huh? Huh? <laughs> the song. <laughs> so now apparently the writers are like, oh, fuck, this movie has to be about something. So we're going to cut up to some color-coded angels that are looking down on Earth, right? We have pink angel, blue angel, and green angel. Imagine how badly your writing has to be going for you to have to flash cut to heaven for your plot. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Meanwhile, in the Eternus, fuck shit, here we go. 
And this is where we find out that the lack of diction isn't just constrained to their singing voice because the angels are completely incomprehensible. I wrote down what she says is, just look at the desolator this memory tube's on the subject of Fath. <laughs> what? <laughs> what? Yeah, so the, the angels have, and I, I, I had to piece this together, it took a minute, the angels have tubes that they can look through that tell you human memories or something. And they're looking through it, trying to figure out what the fuck is going on with, with fashion. Fashion. Yes. That's what the fat was. Fashion. Oh. Yep. Right. Okay. The entire time they do, they're doing this, by the way, they're doing it in such a way that they have to keep putting in these, no, trust me, that was a joke pauses. <laughs> yep. And letting the audience, like letting three of the audience members go, oh, I should laugh. He would be very upset if I didn't. <laughs> They also, they have a weird moment where they're like, yeah, all the fashion trends from different eras are all different. I bet they'd all dislike each other. And I wrote in my notes, I mean, I feel like Bronze Age people would, you know, dig a t-shirt. I don't think it's, yeah. I don't think it's <laughs> all that separate angel ladies. Yeah, so they, they look up the definition of fads or fashion or they something. They read the dictionary definition of fad. <laughs> yes. They're so desperate for things to say on stage. The Oxford English Dictionary defines fad <laughs> as... <laughs> And then they're like, the fad thing references peer pressure. They're like, what's peer pressure? They're like, I guess you could look it up in the same fucking dictionary. But they're like, no. <laughs> no, we're going to ask a ga the Archangel Gabriel. I'm sure he's not doing anything. So he shows up wearing a couch. Yes. Yeah. He's dressed like, he's dressed as a golden hot dog in a shiny blue bun. That is what he's dressed as. See, yeah. That's about to jump over some, like a bunch of buses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> now, all I can imagine is that they had to pick their costumes from Flash Gordon's leftover bin. <laughs> right. right. Yeah, Brian Blessed didn't want, he refused to wear this so you guys can have it. So, so they asked Gabriel, they're like, hey man, what's peer pressure? And he's like, mm, you know, sometimes it's bad. And I'm like, Sometimes is it good when it's trying to turn people into your religion, Gabe? Is that the exception? <laughs> and it is. Yeah. That's the exception. Mm -hmm. Also, at one point here, I think it's just a mistake with the editing or the copy that's on YouTube. But at one point, Peter's face gets blurred out like he was originally played by Chris D'Elia. <laughs> I found it very distracting. Hang on. There is that cult case that went through that said, you have a right to be forgotten on Google. Sure. Do you think yeah. that actor's done that? <laughs> yeah. It's like his name is scrubbed and they've had to go through and scrub his picture, yeah, his face yeah. out of all of the, yeah. the scenes. <laughs> so, so yeah, so we listened to Gabriel explain peer pressure from cocaine's point of view for a little while. And then <laughs> God shows up in the form of like flashing epilepsy lights. And Gabriel's like, what's that, God? I should send them to Earth and make them pretend to be teenagers long enough to learn this lesson about peer pressure? Is that the plot? Okay. <laughs> also, I just have to point out that when God showed up with his flashy lights, the app that I have on my iPad for epilepsy popped up a warning that said, this movie might not be safe for you. And I was like, you're telling me <laughs> fucking <laughs> app on my iPad. <laughs> Continue. <laughs> so they do this whole, like, your mission, should you choose to accept it, is to 21 jump street your way into the high school at the, at the center of this story and learn about peer pressure. Right. How badly did you guys want a shot for shot remake of Varsity Blues, but with angels? <laughs> <laughs> I was only trying to think of like never been Christ doesn't quite. Oh, <laughs> I think I, he says you have to infiltrate the high school. I'm like, yeah, Christianity has gotten way better at that since 1985. Let me tell you. <laughs> but then he warns him. He's like, but it could be dangerous because Satan could rip your soul from your flesh and torture you for eternity if you screw this up. Yeah. Thank you. Cause because loose I, I did not remember that being part of the mythos. Right. It's like, <laughs> well, angels. Cause I feel like that's a very different pitch, right? Then you're gonna go down and see what it's like to be in high school. But of course, if you mess up, Satan will tear will rent you limb from limb. <laughs> They're also, they're weirdly scared of Satan. Like, oh no, not Satan. And it turns out Satan is just behind them because like what, he lives nearby anyway. So Satan isn't like this big, evil, scary figure they've heard of. He's just like the neighbor who's an asshole or something. Right. I don't know. Yeah. yeah. So he comes in and he starts talking shit. He's, it took, it, none of us got this in the moment, but eventually we all realized that he's calling them twerps. He keeps mm. calling the angels twerps, but he's doing the, the exaggerated Jersey accent. So he's saying twerps. Mm -hmm. I heard 
twats like or twats <laughs> every time. It's like fucking hell, Jesus. I mean, in England, that's not that uh, the harsher word, but in America, that's pretty strong stuff for a for a Satan in a Christian movie. Yeah, you want to ask about the crazy billionaire remake? It is just whatever Marsh's notes thought Satan was saying at any given time. That's the crazy <laughs> Christian billionaire remake we're making at this movie. So Satan leaves. And all, all the angels are a little nervous now about the mission, but they, Gabriel insists. And there's this weird moment where he's like, you got it. You have to give me your wings first, right? Oh, I really wanted the D-winging to be excruciatingly painful. <laughs> for the ah! 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 <laughs> Blood everywhere, like a fucking Titus Andronicus production. Absolutely. Yes, exactly. <laughs> Oh, God, make it stop. <laughs> well, and then there's this creepy ass bit because, again, these are all teenagers and Gabriel's played by a grown ass man. So there's this creepy ass bit where Gabriel demands that they take off their robes. Mm -hmm. Right. He's mm -hmm. like, and now I'll need your robes. And they're all like, oh, I don't think I'm comfortable taking my robe off. And from he's like, come on now, take off your robes. And now I'll need your robes. <laughs> And then they're wearing like these weird nightgowns and there's this awkward pause because they're waiting for the next scene to say. And I was like, please don't ask for their nightgowns. I don't want to be on a list. He just rips the nightgowns right off of the motherfuckers. So he's got to he's going to reveal their teenager identities by ripping off their their nightgowns. One is a valet girl. The other is a nerdy girl. And the other is a surfer dude. Yes. That's what he is. I had no idea at all what they'd made him into. And nothing they said about him and nothing they said to him gave me any clue. And his name, as we find out, was not helpful to me either. No, we'll yeah. get there. I, I mm -hmm. eventually puzzled that one out too. But that was, I was proud of that. That was like unlocking a fucking secret in a game. I expected the <laughs> Zelda's little doo -doo, doo 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 to play or something when I figured out why the fuck they called him that. Yeah. <laughs> it's an ARG ongoing about High Tops, figuring out what the fuck High Tops is about. Also, Valley Girl, because I don't know who wrote this abomination, but they'd obviously heard, like, uh, they stood outside the theater when Heathers was playing or something. It's it's very unclear how they got this dialogue, but they will just constantly have this girl make sexual references without realizing it. She will say, gag me with a spoon so many times in this Christian movie. It's like, why would you want to gag me with a spoon? That's so crazy. Yeah, why I would you gag with a spoon? Is that a phrase? I had never heard this phrase before. Was that a phrase? Yeah, it was absolutely a phrase in the 80s. It's not sexual. It's a bulimia reference. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I would like to, I would like, look, I should know better than to argue with one Noah, Bethesda delusions, but I would like to argue <laughs> that it's a bulimia reference and it's sexual. Well, it could be sexual if you want, but it was meant as a bulimia <laughs> reference. But yes, gag me with a spoon was, was a big thing in the 80s. Just to be clear, Eli, was there an overlap in that Venn diagram? Or was that two separate circles for you? <laughs> it's, Marsh, it's one circle, baby. It's one okay. beautiful, All perfect, right. thick-edged circle. So, okay, but, but so then now that they've got their personalities, we're going to get another musical number, this one about fads, right? And this is what music would sound like if they outlawed tunes. I would, uh, <laughs> I would like to give a special thank out to Michael Marshall for letting me know that this is about fads. Because uh, mm, a lot of my early notes about this number <laughs> had to be deleted. You know, once they gave me a penis, I just jerked off for four days and uh, <laughs> looked up peer pressure on the internet. So... <laughs> <laughs> No, so and, and this is my favorite thing about this entire fucking movie, right? They do this whole musical number about fads and they want all the characters to come out representing different fads, but they could only think of one fad, right? That was hula hoop. Mm. Everything else is just like an ethnicity or something, right? It's just like, oh, or Elvis <laughs> or a dated sketch on SNL. <laughs> yeah, right, right. Uh huh. Oh, yeah, there's that weird cone head thing. Yes. One of oh, the kids is, is dressed as a cone head. Yes. I thought it was either a penis with glasses or like an earthworm. I was baffled. My notes are very confused. <laughs> I, I don't know that it wasn't, though. I, I feel I, your theories are as, as likely as, as Eli's in my mind. Yeah. I mean, I also did write in my notes, look, I was six when the 80s ended. Is this what they really look like? <laughs> I know you were there. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I looked a lot like that. I mean, there wasn't as many earthworms. There wasn't as many sapient earthworms as, as in this scene, but mostly. Mm. Yeah. 
So yeah, if they eventually they do come back around to headbands, which was also a fad. So, you know. Sure. Well done there. But that's it. They also, this song, as it goes, they bring the song to a close and then carry on again, then bring it to another. And they just keep pump faking the end of the song. And the audience falls for every time, like like they're a dog and you're pretending to throw the stick, but then you're hiding the stick. (laughs) But, oh, no, it's not. It's still going, hey, I don't know. It's still still going, still going. Come on, hey, no. It's it's just that so many times in a row. Yeah, no, this this coda was my nemesis by the time it finally ended. (laughs) All right, well, I'll tell you what. Believe it or not, now they have shoes and what are fads anyway are act break type moments in this piece of shit. So we're going to pause there, but we're back in a flash with even more high tops. High tops, look at you running, yo. High High tops. tops. (laughs) Hello, hello, hello. Right, what's all this then? Noah, what is Eli doing? Oh, he's, he's practicing his English to Manchesterese for our trip to QED. My dad ain't got no job, does he? Look, can I just show you guys a map of the UK? Damn it, Morris. You just read the script. Right, yeah, okay. Oh, yes, yeah, flawless Manchesterese. But why does he need that? Well, mostly for ordering food at your fine culinary establishments. Uh, he's gotten a little spoiled by HelloFresh. Why, yes, a full tomato that's just hot for some reason would be a wonderful part of a complete breakfast. But what what's HelloFresh? With HelloFresh, you get farm-fresh pre-portioned ingredients and seasonal recipes delivered right to your doorstep. Skip trips to the grocery store and count on HelloFresh to make home cooking easy, fun, and affordable. That's why it's America's number one meal kit. Meals delivered to your house in a box? Surely that cannot be good. Actually, with HelloFresh, ingredients travel from the farm to your doorstep in less than seven days, so you know they're fresh. And pre-portioned ingredients make cooking a snap and cut down on food waste. Plus, you can have your pumpkin spice and eat it, too, with a rotating selection of fall-inspired items from HelloFresh Market. From brunch kits to a fall dessert board, you'll find everything you need for all your favorite autumn vacations like tailgating, Oktoberfest, and more. It's true. I joined HelloFresh when they became a sponsor, and I'm still a customer even after they stopped sending us HelloFresh for free. I love how quick and easy the recipes are. Plus, they now offer a vegan meal every single week. Okay, no, that does sound good. Yeah. So where can I sign up? Go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful65 and use the code Awful65 for 65% off plus free shipping. Or as they say in Manchester, go to HelloFresh.com slash Awful65 and use code Awful65 for 65 off plus free shipping. Governor. You like, do you think British people just add governor after American English sentences? <laughs> no, just the poor ones. Okay. <laughs> hey, minions, gather round me. Yes, master. Yes, your evilness. I, Satan, Prince of Darkness, A, have decided to journey to Earth for a very special mission. Oh. Lord Satan, what dastardly dee has brought you forth from your kingdom to Earth? I'm going to go to a high school and... Start a satanic cult! Impregnate someone with the Antichrist? Oh, I shall peer pressure a teenage girl to drink and cheat on a quiz. Oh. Um, yeah, sure, I I guess that's a bad... Uh, uh, underage drinking? Sure, yeah, sure. Hey, what's the matter? You guys aren't impressed? I mean, honestly... If we can be frank. Of course, of course. Uh, open workplace, you know. I just, I guess I'm a little confused why you, the Prince of Darkness, source of all evil, spends quite so much time on, like, you know, the, the obedience of teenagers. Yeah, like, maybe you could do some war or famine or Yeah, yeah, something. famine. Hey, I mean, in my defense, the humans are doing war and famine just fine on their own. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. Yeah, I suppose. Are we in open office... Oh, yeah, yeah. Did you guys not get Kim's email? Honestly, she sends a lot. And at this point, I'm I'm pretty much skimming the subject lines, you know? Yeah, yeah, me too. Okay, we'll read them. There's important stuff in there. Sometimes. Sometimes. And we're back for more of this shit. And we're going to rejoin the action with Heather and Tony catching up after the big dramatic shoe shopping moment uh. <laughs> they're going to show it and and they went shoe shopping together and now afterwards they're showing each other what shoes they got which doesn't does the, the timeline is a fucking mess in this why does this film have such a strong shoe theme <laughs> i know it's called high tough but that does not answer the question adequately no no, no actually not, that no. just makes the question worse it, it demands oh. an answer more yeah there's definitely a fetish going on here <laughs> also 
Tony buys shoes with purple sequins, and I wrote in my notes, okay, a third of this audience is now willing to kick Tony out of his house. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yeah, so yeah, they, they both have nice, silly shoes, and then Tony introduces Heather to the surfer dude angel, Twin Finn. Twin Finn. Twin Finn. I didn't figure this out until like much later in the movie, but what they're going for, he's supposed to have two side-by-side mohawks, a purple one and a green one. And that's oh. Twin Finn. They didn't want to act. He wouldn't have an actual mohawk, though, because those are the, the tools of the, of the devil. Uh, so he just kind of yeah. colored the <laughs> edges of his hair slightly green and, and slightly purple and then pretended he had mohawks. So what I think happened is they wrote this whole movie with the idea that they were going to be able to find a sweet wig with two mohawks and then they they couldn't find that. <laughs> so they did this and they didn't change the script because because he says, don't you think my dad will love his mohawks mm. at this point? And eventually it all clicked with me. That's twin fin, like shark fins. At that point, I assumed that was a type of shoe like a moccasin. I thought <laughs> everything is going to be very shoe based in this film. I oh, know, that's fair. That's fair. <laughs> I thought his name was Teufel. Like one of the brothers Karamazov, and I was like, that is a fucking weird reference. <laughs> <laughs> <My tops. laughs> so, yeah, so, but then he's like, don't you think my dad will love his Mohawks? And, she, and Heather says, well, I don't know. Your dad's pretty old fashioned. Now, that, that's 80s code for physically abusive. Yes, oh, it sure is. Absolutely. Yeah. He turns to the audience and he does like a, out of character monologue where he explains that his dad is the quote Archie Bunker type and I would love to know what a Christian audience of the 1980s thinks of Archie Bunker. Right. You mean racist? Is it racist? Is that what we're going for? <laughs> I, I had this realization where I was like, I don't know that Christians don't think that All in the Family is about a guy who gets everything right and his stupid family keeps bugging him. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, so he's telling us this story about his dad's homophobia. And as he's doing it, he's trying to do his dad's Italian accent, but he's terrible at this shit. So the right. accent is just wandering the Mediterranean. <laughs> and this kid is not Italian. Oh, no. This wow. is not a kid of Italian heritage. I, I, like, I, I wouldn't have imagined. And certainly from the accent that he's doing, if it is Italian, it's a hate crime perpetrated by a member of that community. Because <laughs> yeah. um, at one point he says, you know, well, my dad says, dancing and a singing is for our sissies. It's like, well, first of all, like, for one thing, your son's wearing purple sequin shoes, so that ship is very much sailed yeah, by right, this point. Right. I wouldn't worry too much about that. Yeah, he actually learned this Italian accent from Chris Pratt's Mario. He studied that trailer, <laughs> went forward in time. It was a whole thing. So, okay. So then we check in on Valley Girl Angel. She's going to monologue to us for a very long time. And in case the Valley Girl accent wasn't annoying enough for you, she also is going to have a cold during this. How? How has she developed a cold? She's like, oh, I didn't realize that human bodies, I'd get a cold. It's been two hours. Yeah. You've been, you've said you've been down from heaven for two. Where have you been to catch and develop symptoms yes. of a cold within two hours? She must have just inherited. This a, is a drugs withdrawal thing. Already yeah. virulent body or something. Yeah. Right. It's not a cold. This is a drugs withdrawal thing. She's, she's been on the First thing she did was get straight on the smack. 100%. <laughs> I wrote in my notes, look, there was a lot of snorting and sniffing in the 80s. I get yeah, it. Yeah, no, she had to come up with an excuse. But eventually God cures her cold for her, but not until after the fucking monologue. Yeah, yeah. brilliant use of a deity to cure this angel's two hours old cold. Right. Nothing else is going to go wrong in this that, uh, that could have used some deity's help midway through. I also, I just have to note that the entire time she's doing her monologue, Twin Finn and the others are in a freeze but the outfit they've chosen to put Twin Fit in is these incredibly tight pantaloon stockings. <laughs> so I'm trying to make jokes about this girl's Valley Girl accent, but I'm also just staring at this teenager's junk outline <laughs> in deep, deep discomfort. Yeah, no, it was labyrinthesque in its, in its um, <laughs> exposure. So yeah, so but then eventually, ultimately, her monologue ends and Twin Fin introduces her to Heather and Tony. And they all walk off together. And then we get Nerd and all the other unnamed teens. Like, Nerd is over here doing his thing. And all the other unnamed teens show up to make fun of, like, how nerdy he is. And this is where they play a prank on him. Yeah. And so someone goes over to play the prank. And while that prank is happening, the rest of them are all sort of, like, stood watching. And for no reason, one of that crowd 
mounts another of that yes. crowd and is like riding them like a horse midway through this scene for, for absolutely no reason. Yes. Yeah. I, guess. I had to rewind and check because I, I, at the point that I noticed it, they were just on the person's back. And I thought, had they always been on the person's back? Did they come in on the person's back? Is that a thing? I had to find out at the moment that it happened. There are no small roles, Marshall. <laughs> so yeah, but the prank that they're going to pull on him is that they're going to tell him that Barber Pole Girl is secretly in love with him so that he'll go flirt with her and embarrass himself, right? So he does that. He he goes and he tries to say hi and she tells him that he's smelly and, and ugly and nerdy. Yeah, and how he should be in a special school, which, fuck me, that was that was a very quick thing to get to very quickly. Yeah, yeah there was a, the oh, 80s. There was a, they, they should pin some kind of a color-coded thing on people like him so that we <laughs> know, yeah, she got real mm. close to Nazi there. But then she has to monologue to us about how she has rich parents that hate the fuck out of her. Yeah, right. She also at one point says she has an impressive wardrobe, and I'm like, ma'am, you are dressed like a candy from World War One. <laughs> I'll believe almost anything, but you do not have an impressive wardrobe. Yeah. So, yeah, and then, so during her monologue about how awesome she is, Satan shows up in a thriller jacket. I think he's trying to go for thriller, but he comes off more like Bebop or Rocksteady. <laughs> yep. Mm -hmm. For sure. I definitely wanted to throw a donut down his throat right. and help him <laughs> and change him back into a normal teenager. So, but Satan has also infiltrated this school. He's pretending to be a student there too now. Can I just say the stakes of heaven and hell are just a lot lower than I expected them to be in this universe. Absolutely. That was my notice. Like, man, this is a low. Well, yeah, because Satan's just like, hey, everybody, I'm the new kid. Louie, huh? Because it's like Lucifer, but it's not that. <laughs> anyway, do you guys remember that there's a pop quiz in history? And everybody's like, oh, devil. <laughs> <laughs> so. Did Satan make that? Look, I don't want to go full Heath and just create my own fictional universe within the universe of this film. Did Satan make there be a pop quiz? <laughs> Is that what we're supposed to believe? I guess. That's entirely possible. But yeah, so he turns to Barbara Paul and he says, ah, yeah, you're probably going to do really bad on that history test. But hey, what if you cheated on the history test? Ah, and she's like, mm, no, not cheating. Okay, you talked me into it. Yeah, I'm not I'm not going to be persuaded to cheat that easily. Could you give me some sort of shit song about it? And that might be just enough to tip me over the edge. Yes, we fucking this kicks off a Satan tempting them to cheat on a pop quiz musical. Number. <laughs> mm -hmm. And the chorus of this is cheat 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 just, just a, little a little bit. bit. Cheat, cheat, cheat 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 cheat. I wrote in my notes straight out of the Try Guys new employee handbook. <laughs> <laughs> yes, and that's just going to go on for an eternity. And this this song is so repetitive that I started thinking that there was like a like a writer's strike a third of the way through writing this song and they're like we got to make it work guys we got to make it work. <laughs> and so this is the thing this is where I realized that the repetitive nature how every single song in this entire fucking thing repeats every line at least eight times that helps pay off the fact that every single line is indecipherable. You can't understand a word they're saying. So if you get every third word of a sentence that's repeated six times, yeah. by the end you're like, okay, I do know that sentence. It's fine. I've got it now. Yeah, exactly. I've pieced it together. Yeah, it's yeah, like it doing a Sudoku puzzle, but with your ears. <laughs> so yeah, so we listened to the cheat song for an inordinately long amount of time. As this song's wrapping up, they roll out the classroom set. So we end it in first period history. The teacher goes to to hand out the test. They, they stop for a moment here to acknowledge that, yes, the new kids in class wouldn't have to take the test today. <laughs> that feels like a bit of admin that we didn't need yes. played out on stage. We could have <laughs> we could have got that. It's fine. We know how school works. <laughs> of course, now, if any of you actually have like a thousand wings all over your bodies and can call the voice of God into existence, you don't have to take the quiz. <laughs> <laughs> And the audience at this point, they're so beleaguered and confused that when the teacher explains the rules of the test, the audience react to it like it's a joke because they've lost all comprehension yes. of what constitutes a joke. Right. They're like, oh, he walked all the way across the stage without needing assistance. Was that acrobatics? <laughs> so, <laughs> woo! So, I'm not in church and it's a Sunday! <laughs> 
<laughs> anything but church. And it's it's so good because the teacher having like, outlined all of the, the rules of this test then leaves the room once the test starts mm-hmm. and they start singing the cheat, cheat, cheat song again. And I wanted the teacher to come back in and say like, did I hear you guys immediately start singing cheat, cheat, cheat in complete <laughs> chorus the second I left the room? Guys, did I leave the room for zero seconds and you devolved into what can only be described as an orgy of cheating? <laughs> yes. Everybody's <laughs> running around. They're copying off a of paper. Now, first of all, you can't copy off of somebody's paper the instant that the goddamn test starts. What would you be copying? Exactly. <laughs> it's, it's, the test is just, it's a terrible time to copy her answers. Her answers so far are her fucking name. That's all she's written. <laughs> so, so yeah, but everybody's trying to cheat off of Heather and Norman. The teacher comes back. They all sit down or whatever, try to act like everything's normal. But then... Heather gets an F because the teacher catches her talking to Barbara Pole about how she's not going to tell her the answer to number 36 or whatever. <laughs> right. Oh, God. And at this point, this is all taking place on the stage, but there's the blocking of the stage and the scenery. And they've just got the backing dancers who are normally coming on occasionally and doing some like cartwheels, just doing some like sad dances through <laughs> like they're doing sort of ASL via interpretive dance. <laughs> just like, oh, and this is the cheating dance and the sad caught cheating. <laughs> yes. Dance. Yeah, exactly. So and, and the teacher's like, well, you get an F, Heather. And Norman tries the the nerd kid tries to rescue her and explain what's really happening. But Barbara Paul makes it very clear that she will break his fucking dick off if he dies. It's a weird shift in tone. <laughs> I gotta tell you, it's a weird. It's just like you know, the and the the backup dancers are like, "What the fuck do we do?" She's like, I'll fucking stab you in the throat. He's like, hey, "Cheat, cheat, cheat, stab, touch, step, violence, step, touch." So the so the class ends. All the kids shuffle out except for Heather and Valley Girl. Valley Girl comes up to Heather and commiserates with her about how awful it must be to have gotten an F on the test because someone else cheated, right? And she's like, that's right. I hate Barbara Pole chick. And Valley Girl's like, whoa, whoa, whoa. Slow the fuck down. Let's get godly about this, right? Yeah. It's not just godly. She goes into like a deep psychological analysis mode. Yeah. Like she's uh, like a forensic psychologist piecing together Barbara Paul, the serial killer, just everything <laughs> she's ever done to piece together her entire childhood. It's it's really weirdly in depth as a character study. Yeah, no, it's there's there's a Hannibal esque kind of a nature to it all. But yeah, but she figures out that it must be really that Barbara Pohl doesn't think she's good enough and has to take it out on other people. And and it why, why God would forgive Barbara Pohl, so we should too, right? That's the gist of her little monologue here. And then we get direct address from Nerd Girl. We cut over to her and she starts talking about how hard it is to be a nerdy girl in school and not have any friends. And this, this is where we see the characters. They're like, or the scene in the background, they've got these kind of blocks that are moving around to change the kind of the scene all the time. And the characters are climbing on them and jumping on them and then moving them around a lot. And I wrote in this in my notes at this point, I really hope they forget to fasten those blocks down That'd be nice. at some point in moving them. <laughs> I want that to happen rather than anything that's going to happen in the rest of this plot. Just let the nerd guy come and jump on one of these things, it move, he falls, he breaks something, and the next 45 minutes is just watching him bleed out. That would be preferable. I was <laughs> I was rooting for a Spider-Man into the dark moment myself, yeah. yeah. Yes. Mm-hmm. But the nerd girl monologue, this ultimately resolves in the meet cute between her and nerd boy. Nerd boy and nerd girl! <laughs> Except she's an angel that was created when time began. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and, and if you're thinking to yourself, Eli, what a weird joke. That's certainly not going to come into the musical. You're wrong. <laughs> Fuck you. <laughs> that is true. That is absolutely true. Yeah. Yep. So it's funny because the, the way they do this, like he's, they're locker mates, but he's the bottom, she's the top. And <laughs> and she, he, she whacks him in the head with her locker. Oh, God. She barely touches him. Well, yeah. She barely taps him. And like he's currently, com- and he's immediately knocked for six by a tiny little tap on the head. Like his fontanelle never closed or something. <laughs> <laughs> so, so yeah, so he's rolling around and they want to do the love at first sight thing, but they have a lot of dialogue to do before that. So they have to have him like holding his head and purposely not looking at her for a very long time. But eventually their eyes meet. It's love at first sight. He sings about how nerd hot she is. She sings about how nerd hot he is. And then we get a duet. Oh, these characters are each doing a voice that's so irritating. At this point, I wrote in my notes, the movie is as close as I've gotten to just putting my finger next to Marsha's face and saying, not touching you for an hour and 43 minutes. <laughs> right. 
Next month, we'll have him review The Sound of Nails on a Chalkboard for two hours. <laughs> yeah, that's what you've got in your notes. What I've got in my notes is in Guantanamo, as a form of psychological torture, <laughs> they'd play prisoners the theme tune to Barney the Dinosaur at ear-splitting volume. If they really wanted to fuck with him, they should have got the prisoners to write comic reviews of this movie <laughs> instead. <laughs> I just can't stop thinking about how this film is ostensibly about high-top trainers. There's nothing I can say about what's going on here. It's paint-by-numbers stuff. Yeah. It, well, it, in so being, I thought it was the least unpleasant part of the movie, which is, I, I say that because I'm damning the rest of the movie with it, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. But at this moment, for just a second, it's just a story of a nerd girl meeting a nerd boy, which is, you know, at least not terrible and damaging psychologically. There's no homophobia in it for a minute, you mm -hmm. know? But then they start, they're like matching nerd laughs, and I'm like, oh, fuck, man, just bring back the homophobia, I guess. <laughs> Their song ends with a pink oval wipe on the screen. Firstly, because they couldn't either find or afford a heart wipe effect. Yeah, they right. Get that. Yeah. But we wiped to the same scene. Yes. So they just wanted to bring that up and then do nothing with it. Yeah. So the song ends. They have some painfully bad flirt. Like the but it's it's we're watching Heath flirt on both sides, right? It's that's what we're yeah. watching here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, she, he says how she, he's now got like two lumps on his head. She said, you've got two lumps on your head. And he says, well, you know, two lumps are better than one, right? So yeah, but then three is definitely worse, right, Eli? Yeah. <laughs> so, and, but the, and then the two of them laugh nerdily together and walk off hand in hand. Mm -hmm. And then we cut to Tony and Twin Finn at a different locker. Tony opens his locker. This is one of the weirdest attempts at humor, <laughs> like flat attempts at humor I've ever <laughs> seen in my fucking life. He opens his locker, Tony does, and like vines shoot out of it. And he explains to us that, oh, that's the three bean salad that he left in there months ago. Yeah. What? Occasionally, and this is not the first time this has happened, I'm forced to reflect on that this is the kind of material you produce when you can't talk about sex or mainstream media or love or life or anything that matters because you're crazy Christians. Mm. You just end up being like, I didn't eat lunch months ago. This is 12 minutes of our show. Yeah. Yeah. I, I really wanted this scene to be a beat by beat reenactment of the previous scene but featuring Tony and Twin Fin. At that point, I'd be right back in again. Uh, I mean, it pretty much is. Let's not... <laughs> the tension between these two actors is... <laughs> That's true. That is true. He also gives us some more Italian jokes here because it was the 80s and Italians were as far as Christians needed to go back then for their minorities. He explains that he can't stop the plant because if he brings it home his mom will cook it up and serve it to him? Yes. Uh-huh, because she's mm. Italian. You know how they and are they're always serving plants. Eating weeds. <laughs> yeah, beans. Exactly. Yes, that must have been said in the writer's room. Oh, you know Italians <laughs> and their food. <laughs> yeah. Plant Love eating. Love of greens. <laughs> so, so yeah, but he explains to Twin Finn that he's going to marry Heather because he really wants to fuck her, right? Yeah, and, and Tony is more believably Italian than he is interested in Heather. That's, that's <laughs> yeah. why done this. Well, that leads to a really weird moment, right? Because he's sitting next to Twinfin and he goes, apropos of that, he says, so Twinfin, what do you think about sex before marriage? And it definitely sounds like an offer, right? Yes, that sounds like very an much. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Twinfin's Finn's like, ah, oh, shit. Okay, let me get a water bottle and find a shower somewhere. I can meet you in the <laughs> parking lot. <laughs> So yeah, so he, and of course I'm writing in my notes at this point. Well, first I wrote, oh, it's supposed to be side by side mohawks. This is where I figured that out. But then I wrote <laughs> my notes. I wrote, please tell me we're get a, about to get a sex before marriage is wrong musical number. Don't you tease me, high tops. We will. We will get that. Yeah, it, will, it takes a minute, but we'll get there. We will get there. But first, Twin Finn has to monologue about how, you know, Tony shouldn't try to have sex before marriage because that's not how God would do it. I don't know if you heard the story of his only begotten son. I, that, is, <laughs> that is how he did. He also, when he's trying to explain this, I, I know that it's a different definition of take advantage, but he, he stands up and he's like, look, anyone can take advantage of a girl. And I was like, I'm sorry. How did you jump over to rape? My friend? <laughs> yeah. And then so, but twin Finn sends him off. He's like, no, don't try to have sex with her because I'm the angel on your shoulder. And then Satan comes in and he's like, ah, it's all right. That's all right. I'll jump on the other shoulder. I've never seen this bit. And Satan is looking 
absolutely like a 70s glam rock star here, like 100% like a 70s glam <laughs> yes. rock star. Uh-huh. And then the first thing he does is try to get some underage kids to fuck. So it's a 70s British glam rock star. In that case. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, so he's like, I'll get him the fuck. And then he wanders off. So after he wanders off, Valley Girl catches up with Twin Finn and she's like, hey, so what's going on? He's like, well, you know, Tony's trying to fuck Heather. She's like, apropos of nothing, you want to turn invisible and watch the two of them? <laughs> <laughs> Wait, why haven't we just been using our invisibility powers? I said you want to turn invisible! <laughs> and they're turning invisible is they, they wave the hands in front of their faces and then there's a, an amazing special effect put on the picture and then they just like quietly walk behind a bench. Yeah, and yeah. Uh-huh. Bench. So, and mm-hmm, she's like, hey, great. why don't we stay back to back this whole time while we're watching? <laughs> <laughs> So, but yeah, so they they dematerialize and then we watch Tony catch up with Heather and try to pressure her into sex for a while. I mean, as much as this lovely young purple sequin shoot actor can. Well, yeah. <laughs> hey, Heather, what say you and... Uh, sorry, give me a second. What say you and... I, uh, <laughs> oh, I just can't wait to see your... Vag- <laughs> Well, that's the other thing, too, is because they can't really actually say sex here. They don't want Mm. any kids to know more about fucking when they leave than they did when they came in. Right. So he's like, will you marry me? And she's like, it's a little early for that. He's like, we could go to make out point. And then and and that's it. And she's like, oh, okay. So so you be, you know, we're fuck stuff. It's not even make out point, is it? Because they can't even do the same making out. Right. Yeah. Inspiration. It is, isn't it? (laughs) (laughs) I also really appreciated that that he was like, will you marry me? And she was like, shit, our audience is Christian. That's a normal question to ask in high school, but I don't yeah, know. Yeah, right, right. Uh-huh. Yeah, she's like, she says, I want to make lifelong decisions with my brains. I want to get married at 24, you know, the year before the prefrontal cortex is typically fully yeah, developed. Right. That's the, the, <laughs> the optimal time to, to marry. Yeah, no, she goes into this monologue about how abstinent she is. And she explains that she does. She doesn't want to have sex until she gets married. She doesn't want to get married until she's 24. And I'm like, you underestimate sex. <laughs> <So>. <laughs> but yeah, and then after her monologue, the audience cheers her abstinence. Mm-hmm. They're really excited about that. And then Tony gets a little, little date rapey. Mm-hmm. Little, more than a little. This is a weird line they wrote for him. <laughs> yeah. And then they made me wait for it. But then she sings a song about how he's not getting in these pants. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because he he says something that is a music cue. And I wrote in my notes, oh, fuck, he said a music cue. Well, they never learn. <laughs> Don't say music cues. <laughs> and then I realized it was specifically a music cue to I Need a Hero from the sound of her vocals. That's the song we immediately went into. Yeah, right. So I have a pocket theory here because the intro is just a little too long. I think she misses her yes. first cue because it's like, <laughs> bum, bum, bum. And I was like, okay, someone <laughs> someone is waiting for an eight count to resolve before they start singing about not fucking. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And so the fucking, the refrain from this Christian musicals love song is stand back, slow down. Yeah. That's <laughs> their instruction to Christian lovers. And the song is all about how a girl needs to fight and not give in and how he's never going to win her that way. Yes. And the whole movie, like, you just want to say to the movie, you know that, like, women also really like sex. They're often an enthusiastic participant. They're not a prize. They're often, enth- I mean, no, yeah. no, one in the, no one involved in production of this has ever had sex with someone enthusiastically willing, but it is <laughs> no, normally it's possible, the, the experience right, of yeah. Yeah. No, they've been convinced that a wet vagina is a disease by their lovers. <laughs> yeah. But yeah, so but so she sings this terrible, like she's got the worst voice in the show or the worst dubbed mm-hmm. over voice in the show anyway. But she sings this song about how they ain't going to fuck. That's got a kind of pretty groovy bass solo to it, right? Yeah. And then she ends the song by telling him to go take a cold shower and the crowd fucking loses it. Oh my, I, I would have given please. anything for a crowd shot. They, she could have surfed her way out of it. <laughs> so. All right, well, I'll tell you what, dramatically not fucking is a new one on me, so we're going to need a minute for me to process that. But before I take it, let me give Act 3 the hard sell. Will Tony get some conciliatory hand stuff? Is Barber Pole still down to fuck? What the fuck does any of this have to do with high tops? Find out the answers to these questions in part when we return for the cacophonous conclusion of high tops. Hi, I'm Michael Marshall. 
And I'm Eli Bosnick. You know, on my brief visit to America early this year, when I was trying to save my wife from your ravaging plagues, or stranded by your non-functional transportation system, I noticed something. You Americans drink a lot of coffee. Yes, we do, Marsh. Yes, we do. And it made me wonder, why? Well, Marsh, depending on the brand, coffee is two to three times as caffeinated as tea. So we here in the States could use the stimulation because we are so, so tired. But the one part of my day that the capitalist hellscape can never ruin is my morning cup of trade coffee. What's trade coffee? Trade Coffee is a coffee subscription service that makes it simple for you to discover new coffees and make your best cup of coffee at home every day. No fancy equipment required. Plus, trade partners with the nation's top-rated independent roasters to send you coffee that they know you'll love. Fresh to your home and on your preferred schedule. And you get to support small local businesses. A win-win. It's true. Heath and Eli both became customers when Trade Coffee started sponsoring us, and they loved Heath's choices and dark and complex roasts so much that they made an official god-awful movies collection out of his choices. Which I am fine with and not hurt by at all. Dude is on the show four times a year. You chose his coffee choices. No, it's fi- it's fine. I'm fine with it. I'm fine. But yes, Trade Coffee picks out great dark roasts with flavor profiles that I love each and every month. Upgrade your coffee today with Trade Coffee and let them take the guesswork out of finding your perfect cup. That's drinktrade.com slash awful for $30 off your subscription to the best coffee in the country. Drinktrade.com slash awful. Coffee? Because I don't know how long we can keep doing this. Yeah, like, I mean, in England. What you have out the air! <laughs> <laughs> I'm telling you, Malachi, we're totally going to get caught being angels. No, we won't. Just play it cool. All right, class, settle down. Now, today, we're going to be talking about our growing bodies. Oh, darn it. Dude, be cool. So who can tell me some of the things you might experience while going through puberty? Uh, why don't we start with you, the new kid, Jeffrey? Um, right, yeah. Um, our bodies have hair? Yes, yes, pubic hair growth. Dude, how'd you know that? Lucky guess. And uh, Andrew, how about you? Can you tell me which parts of the anatomy might grow larger during puberty? Uh, my anatomy? Yeah, yeah come on. They're, 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 don't be embarrassed. There are no wrong answers. The um, 10,000 eyes and mouths that cover you to sing the song of Jehovah? Fantastic. Wait, really? No, but this is a public school in Florida, so, you know. Right, right. Okay, well, that's all we can say about that. Let's do the pledge again, and then you kids can go do fentanyl in the bathroom. <laughs> and we're back for more of this shit we're going to rejoin the action with Satan harassing the nerd girl Grace I got confused at this point with the uh, the Satan's accent he he referred to her as the Noid oh, the Noid from like the Domino's <laughs> oh yeah right yeah I also was confused by that <laughs> and the means by which he's chosen to mock her is ha ha you're a multi-winged army of God so that nerd kid won't be able to fuck you? Yeah, that was pretty much it. Mm-hmm. But she tells Satan to fuck up. And the audience, by the way, that the audience is fucking great because they treat, as this guy comes on, they, like they play along and they boo and they hiss at him and shit. But like as the show goes on, they start to like actually have a seething hatred for him because of that. <laughs> oh, no doubt about it. Absolutely. I wonder if this guy gets the shit beat out of him after show. <laughs> They're waiting for him in the parking lot. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah but Satan seems to think that like he's gonna trick her into fucking Norman beforehand so she can't get back into heaven which if you think about it is a super cruel thing for God to have set her up for anyway <laughs> so now that he, her and nerd boy Norman are on a bench together and he's talking about how awesome it is that there's finally a girl that likes him and that talks to him and that he that he can really relate to. And why, boy, gee, if something ever happened between the two of them, he didn't know what he would do. And then she tells him that she has an angel and therefore has no genitals and, and, and cannot love. And can I say, I did not see that coming as part of the plot for this <laughs> teen musical is like, oh, Norman, I'm sorry. I'm an angel from outer space. 
Luckily, Norman's a teenage boy and he just wants to get his dick wet. Mm. So he has no follow up questions except whether or not he's going to get to second base. <laughs> yeah. He's like, so the no genitals thing, we've got options there, right? I mean, you, you've got the main things missing, but there's there's other other we can do other stuff, right? It's all yeah. kind of stuff that we can. Yeah. That we could, you could touch. <laughs> but yeah, so he sure is bummed. He's so bummed, in fact, that he's thinking about not even trying out for high tops. Now, and she's like, but then what the fuck would the third act be, man? Yeah, she gives him this weird pep talk, which is all about how, like, God loves you more than I do, which is rough from the woman he loves. <laughs> so, uh, I know you love me, but, like, God loves you more than I do. And, you know, look what God's done to you so far. And that's more than I love you. <laughs> yeah. So, you know. Also, can I just say that during this musical number, it felt as though the pianist was trying to play them off to end the song. Right. Right. Because it, it barely matched what they were saying and doing. It's just like, bang, did I, bang, 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 bang. Yeah. No, I thought at one point I, I thought that maybe the pianist was trying to drown her out and I loved him for it. You know? <laughs> <laughs> she also encourages him to measure himself the way God does. And I wrote in my notes, all or nothing with internal damnation is the stakes. Because I don't think that's a good idea. Yeah. Right. Exactly. Bad advice, lady. So, okay, so then we we get Barbara Pohl running into Satan and she sure is nervous about her upcoming audition to be in high tops. But she admits that it's not so much that she wants to be in the band it's that she wants to do better than Heather. Yeah, she just wants to beat Heather. Also, this is the first time that Satan offers her drugs (laughs) in a pill bottle. Yes, it's it's a Mm -hmm. film canister full of red hots. It's (laughs) It's, it's amazing. Also, I I genuinely at this point was surprised how annoyed I was that the stakes of this movie were that some irritating kids were going to be auditioning for a band that we've been told nothing about. We've seen a tiny bit of them on stage, but we know nothing about why they love this band, what's so great about this band, how big is this band. Why the fuck is it called High Tops? Yeah, exactly. (laughs) We've got no information on them, but that's the stakes of this movie. That's the thing we're meant to care most about here. Yeah, yeah. uh So, but Satan has an idea, right? He's like, hey, you want to do some drugs? And she's like, not yet. And he goes, okay, well, I'll bring it up again later. And then again, and then again. But between now and then, I got a great idea how you can make sure Heather doesn't beat you. What if you just lie to her and tell her that the audition has been moved to a different time? (gasps) Well, Satan doesn't actually suggest that. He says you should do something to stop Heather auditioning. And I thought, oh, they're going to go full Tonya Harding, aren't they? But no. She just says to Heather, oh, the audition's been moved back an hour, but it's still going to be going on an hour later. Even if there was only the dozen kids that we've seen auditioning, it's going to take more. They're not going to have like five minutes at most each with zero turnaround. It's turn up an hour later. You're probably still going to be fine. Tell her it's tomorrow. Also, by the way, the last interaction that Heather had with Barbara Pohl was when like Barbara Pohl was cheating on her in history and made her get an F on her test because of it and then didn't tell the teacher. Why Why would she believe this girl? (laughs) Yeah, holy as she's supposed to be, she does appear to have the memory of a goldfish, which is uh, problematic for her character. Yeah, I did realize the reason why this movie doesn't know how long auditions are meant to take is because this movie clearly gave a part to literally everybody who was willing to be in it. Yeah. Audition for this movie was just like 10 minutes of like, okay, you guys... Yes, um, you're the main guy, off we go. That was the entire audition (laughs) sequence for this movie. So, okay, so now it's time for everybody to get ready for their big audition. The lead singer of the band from the beginning of the movie returns. And we're going to get a song now called I Want to Be in the Band, where each of them (laughs) will come up, they'll do a little bit, a little shtick about their character, and then they'll sing this I Want to Be in the Band chorus right right and the chorus is like the god i hope i get it opening number from fame if it was written by harvey weinstein (laughs) 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 so yeah so we start with tony and the guy's like so what can you do he's like oh i can rock the fuck out of this saxophone he's like can you he's like no but i can hold it to my mouth while they play saxophone noises (laughs) but he says tony what do you do musically He's carrying a saxophone. (laughs) What could he possibly say that wasn't, I play this saxophone? Reach, honestly, that would have been a great reveal if he had reached into the saxophone and pulled out a harmonica. Come on. (laughs) It's all about showmanship. And they're all there with their party pieces to do for this audition. And one of the kids, who's not one of the ones you get a name for, has got a yo-yo. 
And I really love the balls of the kid who turns up to audition for a pop band with a yo-yo. Like, yeah, I'm just, I can do this. I, I, I back myself. I back you got to imagine he's pretty fucking good at yo-yo, though. Yeah, right. <laughs> so, yeah, and so they ask him, they're like, hey, Tony, do you, you know, why, why do you want to be part of the band? He's like, because Jesus. And they're like, right answer. Yeah. Very good. He's like, I want to use my saxophone to serve the Lord. You know, if the Lord ever needs to get it on. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so- in case there's any 13-year-olds he needs to impregnate, I know just how to set the mood. <laughs> yeah, right. So, okay. And th- now another girl comes up, and this character has been just sort of like, you know, chorus up to this point. But now she's going to be comic relief because she's bad at singing. So we're going to do the bad singer sings bit, but she's going to do an entire chorus of this fucking song mm-hmm. in her bad singing. And... Nobody in this fucking musical can sing. They're all dubbed over. So the joke is kind of missed when the entire time we've been dealing with the screeching horror that is this music. And then someone's like that, but up one notch. Yeah, yes, yeah, exactly. Right. Absolutely. And at the end, when she's done her, her singing bit, Chachi, the guy from High Tops, asks her, so what else do you do, Lisa? In a way that could not more clearly be saying blowjob. That yeah. is absolutely what he means by that. Yeah, right, exactly. Again, Harvey Weinstein wrote this scene. Mm-hmm. So, And then we get a guy who comes in and he's the bass. And and, and I guess that's supposed to be the joke is that his, he's got a very deep voice and therefore... He's also meant to be 12. They say, how old are you? He <laughs> says 12. The actor is at least 30. Yeah. Why say 12? It's fucking inexplicable. I, I lost my mind when he <laughs> said 12. Also... He doesn't have like a super low voice, right? He's like, mm-hmm. like I want to be in the band. And I'm like, yeah, no, it's normal low. Yeah, I mean, yeah. probably lower than I could go, but yeah. Right, the movie's acting like he's about to put his feet up his asshole. <laughs> oh, this is because no one in this film has ever met anybody black. They've never heard like <laughs> the bass tenor in like a, a, a proper choral, choral ensemble. So they're like, oh yeah, this is as deep as anybody we've ever met can yeah, possibly get. right. No, exactly. Yeah. So, okay, so now it's it's Barbara Pohl's turn. She gets up and she does her bit. And man, I'll tell you what, this chorus is so good. I can listen to it four goddamn times in a row back to back. <laughs> That's how good it is. Oh, sorry. No, five <sighs> times in a row because then everybody sings it together. Yeah, I, I'm not going to lie. My notes here were less than 30 minutes left, Eli. You can do this. Yeah. <laughs> So and of course the lead singer of High Top stops in the middle of this to tell everybody that you know even if they don't get the part, Jesus still loves them. Oh, he might not love them, but Jesus loves them. I feel like you don't need to Jesus pitch people trying out for your literal fucking Jesus pitch, right? Yeah. Like, the only thing more absurd <laughs> would be for someone to interrupt him during his pitch to pitch him on. Just, hey, I'm, I'm so sorry, Rob Schneider, but um, I just want you to know right now. I also like that we've, this is the end of the audition. They do like a big kind of mm-hmm. finish. They try to end with one of those kind of tableau scenes on a stage, but they're so unimaginative. It's just basically like a pile of kids that they hold. But then that's the end of the audition sequence. But we've only seen four of these kids audition. Why did the rest of the kids turn up? Yeah. If only four of them got to audition. Moral support. Well, sorry, there is one more audition to go, you see, because there we is. still that's haven't true. seen Norman give his whiny self pitying ass audition. He sings the fucking human version of It's Not Easy Being Green. (laughs) He keeps almost accidentally doing Behind Blue Eyes. It's really, (laughs) he's like, nobody knows what it's like. Shit. Um, Yeah. (laughs) And also, the okay, so the voice at this point, this is not the same voice that they dubbed him over with before. They might as well have Louis Armstrong doing this song, right? (laughs) For how much it matches. Yeah, that 12-year-old is dubbed over. Yes, (laughs) right. Also, the lyrics to this song as well, about how he's kind of, he's so sad and no one understands him. This song is the cry for help that a student makes before a school shooting. This yeah. is exactly what this is. I actually had in my notes, this is some school shooter levels of woe is me. Yeah. 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 So, but his song ultimately ends, I'm fast forwarding for the sake of the listeners, <laughs> and the lead singer, the, the high top singer announces who made the audition. Now, keep in mind, we've seen five people audition. Six of them made it into the band. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everyone. Um, 
Everyone is in. Good. It's amazing. Good. The band that we've seen so far is Chachi and three backup dancers. Yes. And he recruits six kids <laughs> yes. into that band. This is every red flag imaginable. <laughs> yeah. This is not a real band. <laughs> This is not a real band. This is a grooming tactic, 100%. <laughs> oh, no. He said he was shorthanded. He didn't say how shorthanded he was. <laughs> yeah. I'm the last surviving member of my band's bus crash. You know, maybe that was a cut line from the show. <laughs> Yeah, and so, of course, everybody goes, uh, the crowd goes wild for the fact that Norman made it in. The other characters, not so much. They don't seem to really care too much about it. But Norman made it in, and he's the crowd favorite. Hooray for Norman. So sometime later, we get Satan congratulating Barbara Pole, And he's like, hey, you know, what would be great to celebrate would be drugs and alcohol together at the same time. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, here's this premium bottle of mouthwash we can, uh, we can swing <laughs> together. <laughs> I also, I could do our entire interview. I promise not to. I could do our entire review of this movie just based on how the devil actor holds a bottle of pills <laughs> from the bottom at his very fingertips. It's absolutely <laughs> insane. It's, I heard nothing else. Yeah, he's like a cop who thinks they found fentanyl. He's like, try not to touch it <laughs> yeah, at all. Right, right. Uh <laughs> So she's like, no, I'm not quite ready for the drugs and alcohol yet. And he says, all right, I'll keep them handy. Wait, where were those friends? Right. I just <laughs> no one ever begged me to take drugs. So but then Heather shows up. Now, Heather, of course, has been told that the audition had moved back an hour. And since it was only four people doing one chorus before six of them were accepted into the band, it's over now. So she's all very upset with Barbara Pohl for lying to her. And while they're having that fight, the lead singer from High Tops walks in and overhears him. Yeah. yeah. And he confronts her. He's like, now, Jenny, Barbara Pohl, is that true? And she's like, mm, yes. It's like she couldn't think of another word that would go there if it wasn't true, right? Like, oh, what is lying? Shit, I forgot how to lie. <laughs> Again, why, why do, so the audition's over. The band leader, the guy who's the, the star of this band, just is still hanging around where the 15-year-old girls are? Yep, he sure the fuck he should, is. He's so clearly cruising for tail, but it's a Christian band, so that absolutely tracks to yeah. be fair. Yeah. Mm -hmm. right. Can I interest you in an I Heart Hot Youth Pastor? <laughs> <laughs> They're making me give all these away. So, yeah, so but he's like, well, I'm sorry, Barbara Pohl, but I have to kick you out of the band for being a satanic cheater. Heather, would you like to audition in this back room, just you and I? And she's like, I sure would. <laughs> And the two of them wander off. Yep. Yeah, yeah, they do. Yeah. So, okay. So now Barbara Pohl's like, you know what, Satan, if you still have those drugs and that alcohol, I would take some now. Give me your pills and start pouring. Pouring wet. He's only got a bottle. Is he just that pour, like free pouring into your mouth? <laughs> <laughs> but the answer is he's got one of those little cough medicine plastic yes, dispenser things that yep. he's pouring he into. He he's sure brought does. little, because these idiots don't know how drinking works. They're like, well, I guess you probably bring glasses, right? You would bring a couple of little. <laughs> 30 milligrams every four hours of, of drugs. And no, no. Alcohol. It's not 30 milligrams every four hours. It's one pill, one shot. Yes. Another pill. Another, Another shot. shot. I yep. think you're mistaking the amounts of each you should be taking there. Like, <laughs> if you're getting that many pills deep, you are you are in trouble already. Yeah, I, I, that was almost my best worst. Was best worst doing drugs and alcohol because this girl essentially drinks a pint of liquor and takes nineteen benzos. Yeah, because she didn't make it into the school musical. Yeah, uh huh. Yeah, so she's telling us all about her daddy issues, and Satan's going, "Huh? Yeah, another pill? You want to do another pill?" Oh, God. When the actress talks about how much her parents do not want her, she gets way too real. And it's like, okay, you, you all right there, Ginny? Like, we still doing the play here? You, you know you're on stage? Come on, come on. She just starts to mumble to herself. And so you end up doing a bunch of Christian musicals. But then you turn 20 and then 30 and you're like, what am I doing with my life? I don't have an agent or a manager and this isn't paying any lort fees. Anyways, yeah, Satan, whatever. <laughs> So she's, and of course, she's, he's got that fast acting alcohol, right? Because she's taken three shots in like eight minutes and she's shit based. Yeah. yeah. And now we, we fast forward through all the fun parts and now she's, you know, just like sickly drunk. Norman shows up, right? The nerd kid shows up so that she can tell him how gross and disgusting he is. There's a moment here. She's talking about Norman. She's like, Norman is awful. And then Norman walks in and she leans against Satan. And she says, speak of the devil. 
and the crowd loses it. Oh, God. It's the I've biggest I've never laugh gotten a crowd that. reaction this enthusiastic in my entire goddamn life, guys. Yeah, maybe it's just the street performer in me, but I was like, man, this seems like a really good crowd. I would <laughs> love to work. Can we just switch to entertaining Christians? Three the tariff jokes is so much lower. <laughs> yeah. So much lower. It's like when you see the diving and then someone does a really complicated dive and then someone just comes up and goes straight up and down. It's like, they see the, the yeah. difficulty's <laughs> not, it's easy to perfect that. There's nothing yep. to it. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And so, and, and Satan's like, just keep taking more drugs. You'll be fine. Trust me. And then she overdoses. I mean, she is very, very easy to convince into an overdose. He's pushing at an open door. Let's face it. Yeah, there's an open no, door right there. Yeah. So the whole gang shows up. Norman's trying to revive her. And the whole gang shows up. She's got an empty bottle of pills and alcohol sitting right next to her. And everybody goes, what happened, Norman? Because <laughs> he's the smart one, I guess. <laughs> There's one guy says, I don't feel a pulse, forgets he said that, and like eight seconds later says it again. <laughs> like Zencaster just cut out on him or something. Guys, did you hear? Did you hear what I said? <laughs> so, and, and okay, and just now at that exact moment, the 321 jump streeting angels at the center of this story, they hear the call from Gabriel that they have to come back to heaven now, yeah. right? He blows his horn and they have to stop being kids. And they're like, oh, wow, should we. Um, you know, help the overdosing girl using our angel powers. He's like, I don't know. That is the bell. And the alarm went off yeah. over time. <laughs> and to go up to heaven, they have to go back to heaven. But it looks like they think they have to walk there because they, they start like slowly ascending the staircase. Did yes. God not spring for an Uber? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, he's texting us. He'll reimburse us for a lift. You know, it's fine. Let's just walk. Let's just walk. <laughs> So, so they go to wander off. Satan shows up to talk a little shit to him before they go. You know, Norman chases Satan off. Right. He comes up to the to the overdose and he goes like, ah, how's the drugs doing? And he's like, you go away. You're Satan and terrible. And, and pushes him and the crowd mm -hmm. goes wild. They love that shit. Yeah, they did love that. And then Gabriel's second horn blows. The angels disappear and everyone starts praying for Barbara Paul because she has just died of an overdose of the drugs. Yeah. This is where we get to really see the editor flex his technology muscles, right? Oh, yeah. He oh, yeah. really worked his Commodore 64 on the footage <laughs> for this one. Oh, 100%. They threw all the rest of the budget at this last 10 minutes. They were holding it all back for the finale. 100%. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. But yeah, so they all pray and then God unkills her, mm -hmm. right? And undrunks her because she wakes up completely sober, which yeah. is the real miracle. <laughs> That's the real miracle. <laughs> yeah, she's not high or anything. Yeah. They were salvia pills with salvia juice, guys. I told you. <laughs> so yeah, but no, she she wakes up. She says, I had the weirdest dream and Twin Finn was there and Valley Girl was there and Nerd Girl was there. And, they were, and we're supposed to be like, oh, she died and went to heaven temporarily. I get it. <laughs> And then she turns to Norman and she's like, Norman, why did you help me when I overdosed on drugs? I'm like, as opposed to what? Yeah. <laughs> Standing over her expiring corpse and laughing? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but Norman explains that they are both vulnerable in their own ways. For instance, he likes computers and she's a massive bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and then Tony like decides that this scene really should be more about him so he turns to heather and he says hey i'm sorry for trying to pressure you into fucking me earlier and she's like oh that's okay is that still even a plot point we don't remember that <laughs> yeah, don't worry right? you're fine all of the rest of the kids in this cast got converted to mega christianity off camera at some point during this film that's what we have to imagine here right yeah, yeah uh-huh tony's doing the old proposal at someone else's proposal <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, but then they all start pressuring Barbara Pole into turning her life over to Jesus so that she'll be less of a bitch. Right? Heather tells her all about how much God loves her, and then that becomes a fucking song. Oh, it does. And Heather is singing really loudly, and then she leans, then she, like Ginny leans in and hugs her, which means now. Heather is singing loudly three inches from Ginny's ear. <laughs> yeah. That's Ginny, three inches from her ear. It's amazing. By the way, the refrain of this song is take off your mask. And I wrote in my notes, man, this Christian movie was way ahead of its time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, for a minute, this really plays like it's going to turn into a threesome with Heather, Barbara Pole, and Norman, mm. which, which doesn't happen. Tony sees the same thing. He's like, oh, I want in on this. And so he jumps in and starts singing as well. Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
And the choreography budget ran out by this point, so people can only walk to one side of the stage while everyone else stands perfectly still, and yeah. then those people walk to the other side of the stage. <laughs> yeah. Sway slightly. That's that's the full choreography budget expend. Oh, God, this went on so long. I wrote my notes. I feel like I'm playing chicken with this coda, right? Like, <laughs> which of us is going to give up it's first? It's 35 yeah. times. <laughs> no, you'll turn it off. The big finale is that they're just lined up in a long queue on the front of the stage saying the same line 35 times. Yes. Yep. And they try, they try for some Rockettes kicks, but they can't go higher than Heath. So they're not, <laughs> not very impressive. And then we end on a big hug between Heather and Barbara Pole. Like as yep. though their friendship was the key to this movie, apparently. They're the high tops all along. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay. But we're not done yet. We still have to check back in on the angels, right? That they're, they're done with their assignment. Gabriel wants to know what they've learned. God, that's a fucking bracket that apparently needed closing. Jesus yes, exactly. Christ. Well, but it ties it all back into the title because they brought new shoes. They're wearing high tops. They even brought high tops for Gabriel. <laughs> and I wanted him so badly to be like, what the fuck do these have to do with anything? <laughs> 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 but yeah, he likes his new high tops. So they all reprise the high top song. The me most meaningless banal song, not just in this movie, but in the history of musicals. Yes. Yep. Gets a reprise. I, again, went absolutely insane here, saying there is absolutely no reason why high tops are featured so prominently in this musical. Full stop. Genuinely no reason at all. Full stop. It is fucking baffling. Full stop. Is there some context that I'm missing? Is it like there's a Rosetta Stone that'll decode this mystery <laughs> for me? <laughs> <laughs> so... My favorite thing about this, by the way, is that they do the exact same choreography that they did for the first time they did the high top they song. They sure yeah. do, yeah. Which includes the assisted backflip and the butt spin attempt at break dancing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. The chorus of this song might as well be reminder that the play was called High Top. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Also, this is when they do the bows, right? Like at the very end of this yeah. is when they do the bows. And the only reason I point that out is that everyone gets the bows, except when Satan comes out, the crowd is still in their fucking hip Christian hypnosis. So they just boo the actor. Yes, during his yes. So good. And the curtain so call, good. they're still booing. <laughs> and he's a, li a little hurt by it. You can yeah. see him be like, I'm show's over, guys. You could just fuck you, boo! I'm just Dave now. I'm just you're booing. <laughs> fuck you, Dave! Oh, there is an 80% chance that audience still think he's Satan yeah. to this day. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely. Oh, shit. And then we get to the credits, and I don't have any... Marsh has got extensive notes on the credits. I didn't have any <laughs> notes there. Sorry, Yeah, Marsh. no, I'm going to leave that to you, No. <laughs> well, I just wrote that I'm a professional, so I've actually watched these credits. Take that, Cara Santa Maria. And then I realized that Google Docs immediately linked Cara's name to me saying her name in the Google Docs. <laughs> and I wrote, don't link her name here, Google Docs, you snitch. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> All right. Well, I, you know, this this movie kind of wore its moral on its sleeve. The only real question is what the fuck it has to do with high tops. And I'm not going to ask you guys that one because, you know, we all have our limits. So instead, I'm going to thank Marsh one more time for helping us out this week. And hey, while well, we still have you here, remind our listeners where they can go to hear more from you. Absolutely. You can hear me on Skeptics with a K every two weeks where I'll be doing some skeptical analysis of various uh, interesting investigations that I've been doing. And obviously you can come to QED where you guys will be and so much of the cool stuff will be that is on the 28th to 30th of October. So like basically immediately to now. There's still a couple of tickets left. So uh, rush out and grab those and uh, we'll see you all in Manchester. Hell yeah. And check the show notes if you need a link to pick up your tickets or to check out Skeptics with a K. And well, that does it for our review of High Tops. That's not going to do it for the episode just yet because we still need to subject ourselves to more pain and suffering. So Eli, tell us what's on deck. While visiting the ancient walls of the Holy City, two American young women and an anthropology student must survive a biblical apocalypse. We'll be getting back into a far more traditional spooktacular spirit with Jeru Zat. Zalem. Zal with a Z. Z, Z. All right. So with that to look forward to, we're going to bring episode 374 to a merciful close. Once again, a huge thanks to Marsh for helping out today and a perhaps even huger thanks to all the Patreon donors that help make the show go. If you'd like to count yourself among their ranks, you can make a per episode donation at patreon.com slash godawful and thereby earn early access to an ad-free version of every episode. You can also help a ton by leaving us a five-star review and by sharing the show on all your various social media platforms. And if you enjoyed this show, be sure to check out our sibling shows, The Scathing Atheist, Citation D&D, &D and The Skeptic Credit, available wherever podcasts live. If you have questions, comments, or cinematic suggestions, you can email godawfulmovies at gmail 
gmail.com. Legal services for this podcast are provided by the law offices of P. Andrew Torres. Tim Robinson takes care of our social media. Our theme song was written and performed by Ryan Slotnick of Evil Drafts on Mars. All other music was written and performed by our audio engineer, Morgan Clark, and was used with permission. Thanks again for giving us a check of your life this week. For Heath Enright and Eli Bosnick, I'm going to promise to work hard to earn another chunk next week. Until then, we'll leave you with a Breakfast Club close. Eli bought the script to this movie the minute the recording was finished so that he could be off book for the live performance at QED. <laughs> Damn right. The Daft Punk Space Angels went on to be in a way cooler play with ninjas and laser guns. Norman is now an atheist and gets way, way more tail as a result. I mean, the movie kind of implied that he was going to get laid before Tony, right? right? It's, it's, yeah. just, that is true. Barbara Paul was ready to fuck. He got to do hand stuff with the angel, right? I think we agree. Yeah. The preceding podcast was a production of Puzzle and a Thunderstorm, LLC. Copyright 2022. All rights reserved.